Hi, welcome to the Get It Right podcast. I'm Bridget King Farragan, the marketing manager at Ferrite, and I'm Mike Garrison, lead product manager here at Ferrite. And today we're going to go over some of the basic questions that we get on our website and we get, you know, throughout our travels, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the first one being, what is Ferrite? So Ferrite, the material and not the company, right. is a ceramic-like soft magnetic material. Um, primarily made of iron oxide. Uh, it's got a whole variety of different uses and all sorts of different applications and devices and such. And what makes it a soft ferrite? So ferrite, as I mentioned, is a soft magnetic material. And basically what that means is it's not going to hold any residual magnetism. So a magnetic field can be placed within the ferrite. Um, generally by a coil of wire around it or through it or whatever the case may be that has a magnetic field when current's flowing through it. And that's going to align all the dipoles in ferrite material. It'll act like a magnetic material. As soon as that field goes away, all the dipoles kind of randomly orient themselves again, and you wind up with just a you know, ceramic lump doing mm. not much. Now, that contrasts to hard magnetic materials, which might be something like a fridge magnet, when you would think about a hard magnetic material. I love those. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, you know, soft, there's soft and hard ferrite. Um, you know, that specific type of material, there is soft and hard versions of them that serve very different functions. You might find something like hard ferrite in... Um, Motors is a good example. Those are common uh, use cases, motors for those. Um, soft magnetic ferrites, um, different use cases. Mm. And what are like the two types of ferrite? So, like I said earlier, they're primarily all made out of iron oxide, um, but there are different subsets of the material. So the main two types are going to be nickel zinc ferrites, and manganese zinc ferrites. So iron oxide is going to be the bulk of it. The next biggest element is either going to be manganese oxide or nickel oxide, um, followed by zinc oxide and a whole bunch of other herbs and spices that make up uh, all the different types of material properties. Um, there's two other types as well that are somewhat common, which would be manganese which would have the emission of that um, zinc oxide, and then also magnesium zinc. So on our website, we have a materials page, but those are different. Those are our materials. Yeah, so the majority of those materials are going to be either manganese zinc or nickel zinc ferrites, but there are a lot of grades aside from just manganese or nickel zinc. There's, you know, 10 or 12 different types of nickel zinc and manganese zinc that all serve different functions. Um, broad strokes, manganese zinc is going to be high permeability and lower frequency. Nickel zinc is going to be low permeability, higher frequency materials. And why do people need ferrite? So ferrite serves a variety of different functions. So it can serve uh, functions like an inductor or a transformer that's going to be used in power conversion type applications. Um, it's commonly used for antennas, for um, sensor assemblies, uh, RFID tagging, things along those lines. And commonly, and, and what we are probably best known for here at Ferrite is suppression applications. So Ferrite is used very commonly for EMI suppression, which is electromagnetic interference. Um, most electronics generate some level of electromagnetic interference. There are uh, you know, both functional limits that the ferrites will help bring that noise down to. And I say functional, I mean the electronics are just not going to work if there is too much of that noise. And then there's also um, governmental limits set 
um, different places around the world with different limitations at different frequencies. And that's to um, ensure that things like planes falling out of the sky doesn't happen with a lot of radio interference. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of high frequency energy backfeeding into the grid. Um, you know, if I have a non-compliant device and I plug it in somewhere, Armageddon doesn't happen necessarily, but if a thousand people do that, now you might have a transformer down at your local power station or, you know, transfer facility that is now smoking because it's mm. designed to work at 60 Hertz, not... 200 megahertz that's being backfed down the lines. So, you know, there's limitations in place for those types of reasons. Ferrite's a very common way to uh, reduce that high frequency EMI. So how do they know they need it? So the functional one's pretty easy. When you design a new <laughs> product and try to test it, it doesn't work right. Um, you know, you may be something kind of weird, like you're making a left turn in your new car and your radio station blips out okay. every time you do that. Um, now, the stuff that's not functionally mm -hmm. not allowing a device to work, but is a problem for regulatory, usually that'll have to be found out in a laboratory setting. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of EMI um compliance labs out there mm -hmm. that are going to test to those limits. They have specialized equipment for testing to that. And all electronic products that get sold have to be compliant to those standards. So when they go to compliance testing, it'll, I mean, hopefully not fail, but sometimes they'll fail. And ferrite winds up being a common strategy for bringing those products into compliance so they can be sold. Uh, ideally you'd like to find that out before it goes to testing because yeah. it's not cheap. Um, but that's not always reality. But if we have those pretty kits that are in all the labs. Yeah, those are, um, I like to call those soft magnetic band-aids. Yeah. So we have, um, kits of very easily affixable cores located in most of these laboratories. So when something is failing compliance, uh, you can walk over to that kit. You can't actually see it that well, but there's a frequency chart up there showing where different materials. Um, that's why there's so many different material grades. But, you know, that chart shows, you know, there'll be a chart above the kit that's going to show where each material grade is um, good for suppressing. So when you know you're failing at a certain frequency, you can snap one of those cores on there and hopefully bring the product into compliance and not have to go back to the lab. And not have to tell your boss you need another day. Yeah. That's definitely very important. Um, so, okay, so we have suppression snap -its, right? And that's probably what we're most known for. But what if you don't want the snap -it in your final design? You can switch it out for the solid. Yeah, so the snap -it cores are a little bit bulkier because they have a plastic case and a hinge and everything on them. Um, so, you know, sometimes in the final design, you may want a solid core on that cable. Most of our snap -its, not much, I think now all of our snap mm -hmm. have a solid core equivalent. So if that snap it works, the solid core will now also work. Okay. So, you know, you shouldn't really have to go back and test to make sure that the solid core is going to perform the same way the snap it core does. So you can then use that. It's able to be overmolded. It winds up being a little bit smaller on the cable. Um, you know, potentially a little bit lower cost just because less complexity to it. It's just a tube instead of, you know, clamshell thing with a case and two pieces and all that. And then uh, we have other engineering kits for our other product lines in case they don't want a snap it. Yeah, no, um, ferrite's not just, um, we make more than snap -its. Um Snap? <laughs> I can't snap, so no. I'm jealous. Well, you can snap a snap it. I can snap a snap it, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we have different engineering kits, so if you're designing a RFID antenna, you know, there'd be a rod kit. If you have not on cable, but on board suppression that you need, there will be chip beads, surface mount beads. Um, you know, if you're developing transformers, inductors, there's toroids and power magnetics kits, um, 
flex sheet kits. Yeah, we have a kit for most eventualities. Okay, so what makes our materials better than, than everyone else's? Um, so, you know, I kind of alluded, you know, we're best known for suppression. So our suppression materials are, you know, we have a lot of them, first of all. So mm -hmm. most suppression ferrites offered by most manufacturers come in like a, a high and a low frequency variety. Maybe if you're lucky, there'll be a middle frequency variety getting really, uh, really granular there. We have, I think it's around 10, 11 materials that are suppression materials. That's what they're designed to do. So they're going to handle different frequencies a lot better. So with a lot more granularity. So if you have a problem at say 300 megahertz, you know, there's a material that's going to be really good at 300 megahertz. And then we start going into more different, we call them secondary characteristics. So other considerations that you might have when you're working in a suppression application. So you might think, um, you know, about temperature or bias currents, the necessity for that material to not be conductive. Manganese zinc materials are conductive. So you may need a non-conductive version of that. Uh, little differences like that, that, you know, get you really kind of the best possible solution and not just um, a solution. Mm -hmm. you know, typically one of the ways ferrite's handled is we just throw ferrite at the cable until something works correctly. Um, we could put a little bit more science into it than that. That's a marketing manager solution, just like throw things. Scatter ground approach. Yeah, hope yeah. something works. Um, yeah, it'll eventually work. <laughs> now, if you're looking at our catalog and something doesn't fit your design, can you get a ferrite? ferrite? Yeah. Um, so we try to have as many off-the-shelf solutions for every possible application. Um, but there's a whole lot of applications out there, so we can't get them yeah. all. So, you know, when there is a uh, need for something that is a little bit more optimized or tailored to your particular application, uh, we can custom make ferrites, mm -hmm. um, materials even sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, when you look at our catalog, that's probably about 20% of the total part numbers mm -hmm. that we actually produce. Um, so there's a whole lot of capability here for doing custom solutions. Okay. So some of the other top questions we get. Do we still manufacture in the U.S.? We do still manufacture in the U.S. Right here in Walk Hill, New York. Yeah, like right behind <laughs> that wall. Um, and where else do we manufacture? So we manufacture in – so the U.S., we have powder manufacturing in – Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, the production facility here in New York. We also manufacture in um, China as mm -hmm. well. We have um, two facilities over there. Mm -hmm. And then we are we pride ourselves on our quality. So one of the things that we always do is we um, have our quality certificates updated. So what are our quality standards as of right now? So we're ISO 9001 and IATF 16949, which for those that don't know, IATF 16949 is an automotive um, qualification standard used widely in the automotive industry. And we also more recently have become uh, ITAR registered. Yes. So speaking of automotive, right? What other markets do we think or are we found in? I guess is always the question. Uh, most things with electricity. Okay, so that so, narrows it down. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> all over the place, really. I mean, if there's um, voltage changing in most electronics, you know, that's a opportunity for ferrite to be in there. Um, and again, I said, you know, antennas, inductors, transformers, suppression devices so i mean it, it really ranges and nowadays i mean it, it's more stuff than it ever has been that we're in mm -hmm. um you know you think about really simple electronics you know back in the day you would have a light bulb no weird right mm -hmm. um just a normal light bulb but 
nowadays that light bulb is now an LED bulb that has a switching converter in it to drop it from, you know, convert it from AC over to DC and drop it from 110 volts down to the three volts needed to run an LED. And compounding on top of that, that light bulb may now also have a wireless uh, access point and stuff and into it and speaker and be able to change colors yeah. and you can communicate it with your phone and all that complexity adds noise. It adds you know, the need for conversion, voltage conversion throughout there. Um, so it's it's just more things than ever. So more for more time to call us. Yeah, okay. yeah. Right. I mean, cool. again, we're yeah. <laughs> Ho hopefully, your design just works, but it, it doesn't always turn out that way. Um. Okay. So I think that's like a big bit of our first questions. I guess if you have anything that you want us to post about, feel free to comment. Um, we'll be back with some more videos in the next few weeks. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.